You are listening to the Super Mom is Getting Tired podcast. I'm your host, Tori Henderson, and this is episode 151. All links and show notes can be found by going to lifecoachingforparents.com slash 151. Welcome to the Super Mom is Getting Tired podcast. This show is designed for moms who invest everything into parenting, but get overwhelmed, lost, and resentful. Listen and learn how to unburden yourself, feel calm, full of energy, and in control. I'm your host, Master Certified Life Coach, Teacher, and Recovering Supermom, Tori Henderson. Hello, Supermoms. How are you? You made it through another year. Congratulations on getting your kids out of school and into summer. I hope that you've got some exciting travel plans coming up this summer because that is what we're going to talk about today. I am at the tail end of my move, so my house is sparsely decorated, which is amazing how much mental space and clarity I have when there's hardly any clutter or any chores to do in my house. You realize how much just the house becomes your to-do list when you walk through it. And then when there's nothing really to do, oh my goodness, the amount of mental and emotional space that comes along with having physical space it is wonderful. And so because I've got a little more time and energy and space in my life, I would love to reconnect with some of my super mom alumni. If you have gone through my life coaching for parents, 12 week coaching program, I call it super moms getting tired. If you have gone through that coaching program and it has been a while and we have not talked, I would love this opportunity to catch up with you. I've got time in my calendar and if there's no like pressure or, you know, obligation, I just want to see how you're doing and reconnect is the purpose of my call. So you can go to lifecoachingforparents.com slash alumni. And I've created a special link so that we can schedule because I've got room in my calendar and I would love to use it to reconnect with you. So today's topic is about some vacation and traveling strategies. If you are gearing up for traveling with children this summer, but especially children who might be a little anxious, inflexible, or neurodiverse, this episode is for you. Now, I would not describe my children as anxious, inflexible, and neurodiverse, and the stuff we talk about, it would definitely have benefited from me. I have one kid who I I think I would describe her as a homebody who likes routine, and I have another kid who loves to travel and loves novelty, but he's very sensory sensitive, and he forgets about that because when he's at home and in his routines, he's not challenged that way. And so it's the overstimulation that comes with travel that he kind of forgets about and then suffers the consequences as does his mother or I used to anyways for years. So my kids are not the target market for this book, but I found today's interview very valuable. So I want to say if you have kids, this interview is for you. Because I am sure I'm not the only one that has ever gotten really excited about getting away with the kids and taking a vacation, but then you come back from your vacation more exhausted than before you left because there's so much upheaval and change and transitions. And then when you're parenting, you have to adapt not just to yourself, but to them and the ever-changing environment so that you end up needing a vacation from your vacation, right? That's not the only one that's been there. Or maybe you've planned a relaxing vacation for you and your family, thinking you're going to get to chill out and just lay on the beach. But after the third meltdown of the day, you find yourself yelling, this is supposed to be fun. Or do you know how much this is costing me? Please tell me I'm not the only one that has felt that as being at Disneyland or something. I get in this really crazy like mindset where I have to like maximize the spend, you know, and when you, something like an amusement park where it's so expensive and I, I get into like this fury where I want to hit everything and get my money's worth. And guess what? 
my children do not. They want to stay and hang out at the hotel pool. Or I remember going to Disneyland with my, he was probably two. And he wanted to spend all of his time at the park. Did you know that they have, not the amusement park, they have a playground with like slides and climbing ropes. And I never knew that Disneyland actually had this. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to stay in the, his familiar zone where he got to climb and slide and go on swings or whatever. And I'm thinking, there's this entire park with like rides that you never get to go on. So today's interview is here to help you save your sanity and keep you from going crazy because it's easy to get caught up in the excitement of a vacation and develop a sort of short-term memory loss about the challenges of traveling with children. So I want to take a minute just to remind you that travel rarely provides a vacation from parenting. In fact, it can often require more kind of hands on deck to deal with the constant transitions and the lack of routines and comfort that comes along with traveling. So I want you to align your expectations or your expectation that vacations are trips, not necessarily a vacation. Okay. When you're traveling with children, you think of it as a trip. When you're traveling by yourself or with girlfriends or with your partner or with somebody that is an adult and can manage themselves, then it can be a vacation. But with kids, we want to think of it as a trip just so that you don't get disappointed. Because aligning your expectations with the reality of travel, that it's just like doing the work of parenting from a different location, sometimes can make your life easier. Okay, sorry to burst your bubble, <laughs> but I, it's for your own good. It's to help. So once you have set up appropriate expectations for your summer travel plans, then you can focus your attention on preparing the kids for a successful vacation. And there is a lot that parents can do to set them up for success. And I kind of forgot all this until this conversation I had with Don Barkley today. So when you're at home, it's easy to forget how much of your kid's ability to thrive depends on predictable routines and familiarity. So whether your child is neurotypical or neurodiverse, whether your child is sensory seeking or sensory avoidant, today's podcast is designed to set your family up for a successful summer vacation. And we are going to do that by talking with Dawn Barkley. She is the author of Traveling Different, Vacation Strategies for Parents of the Anxious, the Inflexible, and the Neurodiverse. We will talk about how to choose a trip suited to their temperament, how to prepare them before it's time to go, and different resources available to help kids travel successfully. Did you know that airlines cruises and amusement parks have resources in place to help neurodiverse kids enjoy family vacations? I did not know that either. There are tons of travel tips in the book. So especially if you've got a neurodivergent, anxious, rigid, inflexible kid who likes routines and gets stubborn and strong-willed and oh, anything like that, But for sure, go check out her book because we are not going to cover the massive amount of resources that she has in her book called Traveling Different. And there is a link in the show notes that you can use to go and check it out. But Dawn is an award-winning author who has spent a career working in different aspects of the travel industry. She, after spending 10 years working in sales and marketing, she branched out into travel trade reporting with positions at Travel Agent Magazine, Travel Life, Travel Market Report, and Insider Travel Report. She is a mother of two and resides in New York's Hudson Valley. She's a member of the Society of American Travel Writers and the Family Travel Association, and she also writes fiction as DM Barr. So, I hope you enjoy this interview and conversation with Dawn Barkley and check out her book, Traveling Different with the link in the show notes and have a fabulous summer with your children. And I hope that this book and this interview will help it be as successful as it can possibly be. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I have here with me a special guest today. It's Dawn Barkley and she is author of a book called Traveling Different, 
vacation strategies for anxious, inflexible, yes, and neurodivers. And how timely to have her on the show as we're gearing up for summer. And parents have may have anxious, inflexible, or neurodiverse kids. You probably know whether you do. But I would also say this is a great episode for anyone who's got like sensitive or sensory kids, which we talked about in the past. So welcome to the podcast, Dawn. Thank you so much. I hate to correct you, but the title of the book is actually Vacation Strategies for Parents of um, the Anxious, the Inflexible, and the Neurodiverse. Well, very good clarifying point. <laughs> so I only so people will find it if they want to if they want to buy it. But it is geared to parents, and it is geared geared to both neuro parents of neurotypical as well as neurodiverse children because all children get anxious and flexible when they're taken out of their comfort zone. Yes. And I can attest to, since I am currently moving from one house to another, just even how my husband and I react differently. Like he is very unsettled. He is very uncomfortable with sort of living in two places where for me, I'm kind of digging it. (laughs) And, but yet I just got back from a trip through, you know, an airport and I was so overstimulated just with all the lights and the sounds and the announcements. So even if you're not neurodiverse, this is definitely a podcast. If you notice that you've got some sensitivities and you want to plan a vacation that works for you and your kids and just the whole family to kind of give you what you're really looking for, right? Which is to vacate your regular (laughs) life. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit about before parents even get started with the planning, what kinds of things should they consider? If they've got some anxious, inflexible kids and they want to make sure they have a successful vacation time, what kinds of things should they think about ahead of time before they even put down deposits? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing you want to do is introduce a child to the concept of travel. You never want to spring a trip on a child, an unsuspecting child, like, hey, we're going to Disneyland today. No. You have to prepare them and to introduce the concept to a young child, you can read them books with their favorite characters and travel situations. I do include some, but your local librarian can you know, recommend a lot more. You can do local trips, small, little bite-sized trips, like to the local zoo, the aquarium, you know, a local bakery, even a a yard sale can be a scavenger hunt. It can be an adventure if you frame it that way. I would recommend showing videos at any portion of a trip to the child in advance, whether it's of the airport, the airplane, the hotel, anything you can find. We're in the age of video, so it's not a difficult thing to find on YouTube. But if YouTube doesn't have it, the supplier of the uh, service probably will on their website. I would involve the child in the travel planning whether that means that you vet three different vacation options ahead of time and let them have the final choice so they have some skin in the game. Buy it, some skin um, in the yeah. game, yep. I like it. Yeah, vested interest in the mm-hmm. success of the trip. And they can pick the activities for each day as well out of a choice that you've already approved so there are no wrong answers. You can build a trip around a child's special interests and children on the spectrum tend to have a few special interests, but also neurotypical children do too. So if a child loves dinosaurs, why not revolve a trip around a dinosaur museum or at least include one? And they are in places you wouldn't even expect. There might be dinosaur trails. I could attest to that. I was in very rural Costa Rica, like the middle of nowhere. And we go to this like volcanic, like hot springs or something. And there in the lobby, they're like, come visit our dinosaur park. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Dinosaur park. It was so random, but clearly someone's just passion project. You know, they just made a bunch of dinosaurs and charged admission. So yeah. Well, what I was surprised is I was doing some research on this. I mean, you can even have trails in Connecticut and you wouldn't think of that, but there are museums and that's not a place. I mean, most people think Colorado and Utah, Wyoming. But, you know, they're in places you wouldn't suspect as you've learned yourself. So, yeah, there's lots of different things you can do, including these mini experiences, which I've written about and talked about a lot, which means before you go to the airport, you can sample a dress rehearsal of the airport experience through a group called uh, The Ark, who has Wings for Autism program in over 70 Can you say that again? Wings for Autism from The Ark. 70 different airports run these one day 
bring your child, experience what the airport's like from arrival through boarding. Uh, there are other organizations that are hosting similar. You can uh, also call the airline in question and see if they run something like a tour for you. So, I mean, nobody stops you from showing up at an airport as well. I mean, you can't go through the gates, but you certainly can leave you the airport for a child as well. That's really it, interesting. You know, it's not high stim the way the day of the trip will be. Yeah. Same thing with a train trip. You can go to the station and sample it. You can take a short commuter trip before you take a long train ride. Take a short car ride. Last time when I was boarding the airplane, the there was a mom and a son in front of me in line. And he had bought chocolates at the gift shop to give to the flight attendants and the pilot. And that way he, he was neurodiverse. And that was his way of sort of he could like, he didn't have to look him in the eye. It was kind of a thing, but he could like have a nice gesture. And it was something he was sort of in control of, I think, you know, something that he could do. And that's what his mom kind of worked out. And you were mentioning the sunflower lanyards, which I learned about from uh, Love on the Spectrum, which is the great show on Netflix. But can you talk a little bit about the sunflower lanyards? Yeah. These are lanyards that you can pick up. Um, you can purchase them in various places. They're actually free. You don't have to purchase them, but you can get them for free. And they identify the wearer as someone with, um, you know, invisible disabilities that might need some extra help in various portions of the airport. It actually originated in Gatwick Airport in England, outside of London. And there, if you check out my website, which is travelingdifferent.com, there's a whole story about them and where they're located and how to obtain one. So it lets the staff know. So that if the kid starts freaking out or, you know, having a meltdown or something like that, yeah. that the staff can be aware that this yes. is. Kid That's why. Some yes. it's a, it's needs, a, so. But it's a nice, subtle way of doing it as well. It is. Yeah. And because, you know, airline travel can be very strict, especially after post pandemic. I have noticed they are, they had so many people, <laughs> adult, uh, who aren't adults who aren't neurodiverse, but just having meltdowns on the plane because the level of anxiety creeped up so much during COVID and people were really nervous. And so they were, their best sides were not coming out during the pandemic uh, when they were traveling. And so I think the airlines have gotten tight down about like behavior and like, you, you know, you see the signs, I don't know if you have where you live, but we see signs of, you know, uh, here you need to, here's how you need to behave in this public setting. You may not yell at people. You may not raise your voice or threaten people. Like we've had to sort of be a little more um, blatant with the social etiquette that we expect in public. And so I think those sunflower lanyards are now is a good time for people to be aware that these are out there so that if you get a sort of a very strict uh, or ornery flight attendant or desk clerk, that they can have a little more compassion and understanding. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So getting the kid involved in the travel planning, helping, having them help just choose things, decide, doing little like practice runs and trips so that they sort of know what they're getting in, themselves into. Any suggestions for like the day or two before, like packing up that night or going to the airport? Anything that's sort of like that pre, that prepping them right before their, the trip is to happen? Well, I think the prepping should be all the way along that you would be going through. You might create social stories for the children, get a good night's sleep. Hopefully you have gone over the whole experience again and again, whether it's with a regular schedule or a visual schedule, but you've role played. You might role play the actual getting into the car, packing. You can have the child help you pack their bags so they can pick their special things. They can even keep a maybe a backpack with them with their what they need and what they personally want to have control of. But you should also always have your go-to bag where you've packed a number of important things, including um, electronics with their favorite TV shows and uh, movies and music and noise-canceling headphones and perhaps dark glasses in case it's bright. I just want to pause on that because I think we undervalue the, or maybe we just forget how valuable it is to tell your kids what to expect 
setting the stage beforehand for a trip is a brilliant idea, but this is works really well. Like before you go into the grocery store, you know, we're, here's what we expect when you, before you go to the grocery store, you can choose one thing that's yours, but every, you know, you're going to stay in the cart. You're not going to run around. Mom's going to go to the produce aisle. You can help me like just letting them know what's going to happen ahead of time. That is why like every classroom has the schedule written down on the board for the kids because it benefits them so much. They get a sense of feeling in control when they know what is going to happen and when. And so if you've got young kids, you can create a schedule with photos and visuals that they so they can recognize things. Or if you've got older kids, you can just kind of walk them through. Here's what's going to happen and when and what it's going to look like. So I think it's so valuable, but we might just forget how beneficial it can be to kids, especially when they're doing something new. And then something else you said I wanted to kind of highlight was make sure you've downloaded their favorite shows. I think that's a really good tip, especially for me, because I get so excited about novelty and travel and new things that I forget that other people want a taste of home. They're not as enthusiastic as I am about everything being different. They want familiarity. And so I just wanted to highlight that because that's an easy one for me to forget. Yeah, that's a big part of the book is that children love routine and they like familiarity and they like predictability and travel is none of those things. By looking at videos, by writing out a schedule, by putting together a B list, if if A doesn't go, happen, this is, you know, the the next thing that might happen and going over, you know, potential things that could happen and preparing for that as well, you have created predictability for the child and that will make it easier for them to cope and hopefully less likely to get into a sensory meltdown because you yourself have gone through all the possibilities as well and hopefully worked out, you know, your alternate, (laughs) if this goes wrong, we can do that. And I think that'll give you a sense of confidence so that you're not stressful and conveying that stress even subconsciously to the child. Yeah, I definitely get a little bit of like travel anxiety, like right before before I get to the gate, as soon as I'm at the gate, then I can relax. But all the building up that, there is a little bit, I'm running hot, like, oh God, I don't want to be late. What if there's traffic? What if I forgot something? All that. Yeah. And anxiety definitely ramps up for me. And then kids pick up on it and then they don't enjoy traveling because at least not with mom, because mom's a little anxious. So Yeah, I was never frightened of flying until my mother lost it over Paris once when we when we lost radar and my mother was freaking out. My mother never liked flying anyway. After that, I was always nervous about flying. Yeah, my mom's a nervous traveler. So I wonder where I get it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, really good stuff to remember, remembering that kids like routine. And um, even though they might, I just remember, I went to Australia with my, she turned three while we were down there. So she's a new three-year-old. And it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Like, I remember thinking, Oh, I was hanging on by a thread to sanity. She had just stopped napping before we left. So she was refused to nap. She was cranky the entire time. We were there because my brother was getting married. So it was sort of a, a, you know, I don't think I would have chosen to go to Australia with a two-year-old, but it was so exhausting and stressful. And she was very cranky and the whole time. And then on the airplane ride on the, big, long 16-hour flight home or whatever. He says, when are we going back, mom? (laughs) We were never, ever going back before. That was torture. And so even though she seemed grumpy the whole time, at the end, and I'm seeing this as a pattern with her personality too, after it's over, she's like, oh, that was kind of fun. I just complained the whole way. And then when it's done, I decided I like it. So she yeah. just doesn't like novelty and newness and change or whatever. But then at the end, she kind of, I think, maybe appreciates being outside her comfort zone. Probably because she knows that when she goes back, it is familiar. I'm sure it is. She is definitely likes the familiar. Yeah. So is have you noticed 
that there's certain types of vacation that work better with sensitive neurodivergent or anxious kids? I think you can make any vacation work, but I think when you start out, and it's also based on your budget and, you know, what you want to do. But I I would say that a car trip is a great way to start because you've got lots of room in the car to bring your child's favorite, if you know, toys and games. And if they feel more comfortable with the sheets and towels from home with the familiar texture and scent, you can bring those along. You're also in total control of of where you're going. I mean, traffic aside, you can decide when you're traveling, you can map out a route so that you can stop at certain places that might be of interest. Or if the child needs to burn off energy, you'll know where the playgrounds are or the parks. So you have a lot more control. After that, train rides are also good because Amtrak is a very liberal baggage policy and you can get up and walk through the train when the child gets you know, itchy to, to move. There's the scenic car that shows you all the things that are passing by, all the scenery. If you can afford it and want to have one, you can probably get a roomette on many routes where you can sleep lying down and you also have a private toilet and you have a place to eat if you don't want to deal with the dining car. And the benefit also of a train is that you're not paying attention to the road so you can pay attention to the child. So that's another option. I also like cruising, especially if you're going to Europe or you're going foreign or a a long trip where you might have alternately packed and unpacked several times because you're in and out of different hotels. With the cruise, you're unpacking once, you have the cabin to become familiar with, you have lots of different food choices, and there's always a big buffet, so you can usually find something the child will eat there. There's so many different activities that you're bound to find something that you'll like, and also a quiet area if you need it. The kids club is staffed with professionals who understand children on the spectrum. If you're on the top Mm. five cruise lines, that's not going to be an issue. There's also an organization called Autism on the Seas that actually organizes trips for parents and children with invisible disabilities. So if you want to sort of network with other parents with similar, you know, experiences, that would give you an opportunity to make some friends. The kids are taken care of at the kids club. If you have one child that's neurotypical and another that's neurodiverse, they will all find something to do because there's so much going on. So I like cruising as well. Yeah. But I, I do, I do talk about camping in the book as well. And I talk about restaurants. It's not just all expensive holidays. Right. I'm a bit, I, camping for me is, is a, my favorite, I guess. <laughs> all my nieces and nephews and children have all gone camping because of me, right? So I think that comes from that, like I'm sensitive. So in nature, I feel like I can really relax and I'm very chill and there's not a lot of stimulation and input. And so you can bring things like you're saying from home to do if you're not a big outdoor kid you can hang out in the tent and do some yeah. fun stuff and i've taught many a kid to light fires and you know play with matches in a safe way yeah there's also though a, a lot of caveats involved in camping the, the smells the sounds the fact that there might be loud campers near you the fact that there might be water nearby if your child can't swim that's an issue you want to make sure Bugs that you're not always in this. Issue. Yeah, there's a lot to consider. And I, I do talk about all the ways you, so you can vet a campground and the questions you should ask. Oh, wow. The things you should consider when, when you know, before you get takeoff. But one of the things that I thought was interesting is even if you rent a camper, if it's not working out, you can always pull into a hotel. So that, again, you're, you're in control. Yeah, I could see how a camper or trailer or something like that could be really great because it's like your little home. On yeah. wheels and so you can have all the comforts from home and yeah that might be the way to go and before i set out a tent i would absolutely put out a tent in your backyard for a night ahead of time so the child can again sample the trip before you're actually on the actual vacation yeah i think that's a great idea because that is a whole new experience just like sleepovers at other people's houses is new and kind of unfamiliar and can make you know some people don't like that and it's just good to get them. Ex- it's like expanding their comfort zone. Yes. Right. So that they get used to, oh, I can sleep in, I can sleep at grandma's house. I can sleep at my neighbor's house and I can sleep outside in a tent and then I can sleep in yeah. a hotel. And you're sort of slowly uh, expanding that. That's the way to do it slowly. 
Yeah, yeah, I really like it. You made me think about a uh, train ride I took with my kids when it was like 20 hours. It was a very long train ride. I don't think I would do that long again. But my daughter made a friend on the train. She was like, I don't know, five or six or something. And oh, they were just the best of buddies. And they just went up and down and, and had so much fun. And like, that's just a memory, you know, that makes it so powerful. We're on an airplane ride. You don't really make new friends because it's right. not conducive yeah. when you're all facing the same direction. But, but yeah, that was a really special memory. All right. I was, I'm thinking about how much parental comfort has to do with kids being comfortable. Like, like we talked about, you know, your mom getting nervous flying and my mom being sort of a nervous traveler and how much I love camping. And like, I wonder if the reason that, you know, when I take kids camping that they like it is because I'm so relaxed and comfortable and happy. But if I was nervous and uncomfortable and struggling with tent poles or whatever, that how much that would affect the kids' experience of it. Yeah. Well, they're looking to you to see how to react. So. Yeah, I think that that would affect quite a bit. And that's one of the reasons why I try to write this book as a, as a checklist of all the things that you have to remember or consider. And I think that if you do feel that sort of confidence that you have considered things you might not have considered otherwise, that you're going to approach it with a level of comfort. And it's broken up based on the mode of transportation, the kind of accommodations you're staying at, and what you're going to do when you get there. So you can sort of pick and choose what to read as opposed to read from A to Z, which I never assumed anyone mm. would do. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a can flip through and find the specific scenario that they want. Do you have any, I mean, most of yours is about traveling, but do you have any suggestions for like once you're at your destination, if it seems like your kid is having a hard time adjusting, if they're, you know, kind of melting down and not adapting to the new environment like you would hoped? Do you have tips or suggestions for that situation? Well, that's one of the reasons I suggested that you revolve the trip around some of their special interests. So it's going to, there's going to be something already built in that they're looking forward to. I mean, if they, if they're feeling ill, there's not much you can do, but you can also fall back on making them feel comfortable in in the uh, location you're staying at. So what I always recommend is to pick a hotel with, if your child likes swimming, make sure you have a pool. Obviously, you're going to have a television. Most children can chill out in front of one of those, either a pool or a TV. Structure the trip and pace it so that there's not a lot going on every day. So the child can enjoy maybe one outing in the morning and then decompress in the afternoon. Try to pick uh, destinations that will include a sensory room or have or certified autism centers or autism friendly. And I do list a number of them in the book because then you know that they're geared up for your child. They probably have uh, lower sensory days or less crowded days or at least sensory maps where you'll know where to go, say in the theme park where it will be quieter and they can, they can relax. Yeah, well, say, say more about a sensory room. What can you define that? Well, a sensory room might have dimmer lighting. It might have uh, beanbag chairs and, and, and bubble tubes to look at or things on the wall where you can press and get reactions, you know, different colors changing. But it would also maybe have headphones for you to put on so that you can sit quietly and decompress. And a sensory map will tell you where, say, on a theme park, you'll find quieter areas that are less crowded, whether it's a park or a restaurant or whatever. I mean, at SeaWorld, they have signage which will tell you beyond this point, this is what you're going to smell. And if your child has an aversion to oh, certain smells, there's... they may, oh, okay. you at least have the choice at that time, or they have the choice whether it's going to be worth smelling that smell in order to feed the seals. Yeah. So right. it's really empowering never you. Never dawned on me. Yeah, empowering mm -hmm. you with information so you can make the choice. Wow. Yeah. So it's like really kind of knowing your kids' loves and knowing their aversions. Right. What are they passionate about, and what are they adverse to, or what kind of triggers them? And then it sounds like there's a lot of information out there. If you go to a park, an amusement park, or a cruise ship, or something that that is 
caters to kids, that they might have some information to help you make those decisions of like which part of the park we want to go to or these these there's so many different destinations that are now getting certified as autism friendly certified autism centers or autism friendly and i list as many as i could in the book keeps changing i try to update it on my blog but also if you make i, I had mentioned get a hotel with a pool i'd say also get a hotel or a vacation rental with a kitchen so the child is not always having to eat out at a restaurant, it saves you money. And it also saves in the stress of the waiting and the, the crowds and, and, you know, the different environment. And you can buy food locally that you know the child's going to eat. And I will also say that some children, I mean, not every family can a- afford a suite, you know, I, I certainly can. Mm. So if the the larger chi- suites. yeah, if, if the child needs a place to decompress and wants to be apart, but you have like a double room, I spoke to Tony Atwood, Dr. Tony Atwood is very big in ASD circles, and he suggested taking the linen and putting it in the floor of the closet and making that your child's little private getaway. You know, don't close the door, but, you know, it just is a little quieter private environment for them. And I just thought that was a brilliant idea. Yeah. I mean, in preschool, we used to just put a blanket over a chair and the kid would just crawl under the chair and make his own little fort, yeah. you know, <laughs> like anything that just sort of shrinks it down and, and contains the in, the stimulation and can, helps to calm them down. Yeah. So I think any of those are great idea. If your child is starting to get upset on a trip, these are all sort of ideas that can limit the uh, sensory input and give them an, another chance to sort of regroup throw in there too. Also just kind of remembering that maybe hiring a babysitter or bringing along with you a babysitter or something so that parents can get some time away and not feel, you know, parents need vacations, right? That's why we take them. We need a break. And so sometimes when we can maybe subconsciously put pressure on our kids to do things because that's what we want, right? And like, for for example, I get at Disneyland or some music, when I pay an entrance fee, like I want to get my money's worth. You know, I want to get up at dawn and I will go till dusk. And if you need a break in the middle of the day, like I want you to go take that break with somebody else. I'm, I'm on a mission. Like I get really energized when I travel and uh, I've got boatloads of energy. You know, I'm lucky in that my husband is the one to like go lay out by the pool with the kids while I'm on a high speed touring adventure. Yeah. But like have bringing someone along who can just hang out with the, with the kids at the pool or hang out in the room while they watch TV or take a nap or have find babysitters locally that can kind of come in and give you that opportunity for so you can be you and you can do your vacation your way and your kid can be them and they can do their vacation their way. And so that it kind of creates a win win scenario. Yeah, I definitely discuss various companies that provide traveling nannies and also a theme park nannies that will know the park and be able to accompany you and take the child if you want to do things that they don't. It's a matter of trust. I think for parents, there are a number of parents who don't trust people outside their immediate environment. And for those people, I would say, yes, bring along a caregiver from home or an extra set of hands, maybe the child's cousin or aunt or, or whatever, whoever works, or some people even bring their therapist, you know, if they have a therapist, a young therapeutic aide or someone who knows the child well. I certainly, if I was going to rent a nanny traveling, I would have that nanny meet my child over Zoom a few times before we actually arrived so that there's a, a sense of familiarity. That's a good idea. And that, yeah, they can talk about what they're going to do together. Yeah. Um, I didn't know there was traveling nannies. Like oh, you yeah. could just sign up to be a traveling nanny. Well, I don't think you can just sign up. I think nieces. there's a lot, of, a lot of training involved and they have special ones that just work with special needs. I don't think you can just oh. pop in and be accepted. <laughs> no, that's cool. I just, I, I, as a life coach, I get excited about careers or jobs I've yeah. never heard of before, you know? Yeah. No, I do and, talk uh, about those companies because I think it's a, a nice thing that exists. Uh, my profile, I think a couple of them in there. Very cool. Well, I thank you so much for your time today. I think it's a really good topic and it's something that I wish I had thought more about back when my kids were little. I mean, 
even so, I think when you're traveling with multiple personalities, like not me, but like family members who have very different needs and abilities to tolerate certain things, like it's just good, I think, at all ages to remember that not everybody likes to travel the same way. And what's fun for me isn't necessarily fun for my family members. And and so just kind of all these ways to set set the trip up for success ahead of time, I think is really valuable. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Want a free life coaching session? Go to lifecoachingforparents.com and schedule yours today. And thank you so much for listening. I would love it if you would subscribe and share these podcasts with your friends. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on the air, go to lifecoachingforparents.com slash record my question and you can send me a voicemail recording or write me an email and I'll answer it on the air. Thanks again. Have a great day.